Okay, good morning. Welcome to, oops, got the wrong piece of paper pinned. Hang on a second. And let me adjust my name is over here so I don't do that again. Okay, good deal. So welcome. This is Monday, January 18th. And this is the Mass 208W class session I'm recording. And remember, I record this for anybody who's available. You can come and participate live. If you're not available, you can watch this recording later, posted to our YouTube channel. So the things that I wanted to talk about today were in sections 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, I want you always Remember also that you have a homework one due tonight. So, you know, by the end of the day, which, you know, 11.59 p.m., that's our universal deadline time. Everything's going to always be due at 11.59 p.m., whatever day it's due. And this is Monday. January 18, and then homework number two will also be posted by that time. So I'm not gonna post things often far ahead of time because I just want you to work in the moment, in each section you're doing, recommended problems, homework problems, problems from the book. So concentrate exactly on what you're doing at that time. Now you can work ahead in the Newton Alta work, but focus just on the sections we're doing for practicing problems. These are problems in sections 2.1 and 2.2 that I thought it looked interesting, and we'll see how many of them we can practice here. I'm going to get a pencil handy so that I can make mistakes because I anticipate making mistakes. So let me get my pencil and eraser handy just in case I'm going to make mistakes here. Uh, let's go briefly to our web page in case you want to get oriented. You're slowly getting used to what our web page looks like. I am going to open up a browser and then share it with you. Okay, so let me share screen. It's not particularly important what browser I'm using right here, but as it happens, I'm using Microsoft Edge uh this is on a apple computer but i think microsoft edge is decent and it allows me to illustrate it without being signed in anywhere because sometimes if i'm signed in from google chrome or safari doing something else you might see what things look like from my end and not necessarily from your end so let me get started here. Okay, good. So let's check this out quickly. Just orient you on the website and then we'll get started doing some problems. So our website is the Math 208 website right here. Now we're in week two. Here's a little introduction to week two. Remember, if you want to join our meetings, you can always follow this link Mondays and Wednesdays from 1230 to 155 p.m or you can check out these office hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 11.30 to 12.25, or Monday and Tuesday in the early evenings. Here's our entire schedule. Remember our entire schedule. And this week we're gonna look at sections 2.1 through 2.4. And today let's do some examples out of 2.1 and 2.2. I enter week two, and I have a description of the sections two, one through two, four here, together with recommended problems. Some of them, the first 
list is from the practice problems. And then the book gives also homework problems. So remember how the book gives you a nice summary at the end of each chapter, calling some problems practice problems and some problems homework problems. Whatever they are, I'll just refer to them by their numbers there. You're working on these assessments. You're working on the Newton Alta homework. So you are all inside that system. And the group of sections in the first, roughly the first two chapters into the third chapter, I could be more specific about that later, statistical definitions, frequency distributions, group data, histograms, graphs, measures of central tendency, measures of variation, fractiles. That is how the Newton Alta describes these topics, not exactly matching the book. Now remember, your goal is to work in these sections till you get 100% correct, and you can get 100% correct. We don't mark you plus or minus by any individual problems, but you can get 100% credit on the Newton Alta homework. You have until the end of the semester to get 100% credit in all Newton Alta sections. But when I say do February 1, I'm recommending that you complete this first batch of sections by February 1. Maybe I will add recommended completion of February 1 instead of do February 1. And then you won't feel like uh, that's a hard due date right there. They're due literally at the end of the semester. I might make a note of that on my website just to make it easier to consume. Written homework is due on dates listed. So tomorrow, this is, oops, 19, excuse me. So I'm gonna go back to my paper and adjust that. Tuesday, January 19. You have homework number one due and homework number one you can get by following this link. So you have two questions here that came from chapter one. And then once you hand that in or shortly before you hand that in, I'll post homework number two, which is due on the 26th. You see first exam covering section chapters one through five is going to be in February 17. And we'll talk more about exams as they come closer. Remember also on our resources page, click up here on resources, you see a complete list of assessments by due date. And once the due date is passed on a written homework, I'll also post a solution. Here are all the Newton Alta categories I want you to work on. There's about 30 categories here. So even though you can work on them to the last day of class, you do not want to save these to the last week or day of class. You won't complete them all. And you want 100% credit on that section of your grade. Let's go back to week two. So after the assessments, I've got some handouts here, class session notes, like today's class session notes that we'll post after I get out of the session. Office hour notes, if people attend the office hours, I also post the notes people ask, the questions people ask at office hours. Some recent announcements, uh, videos, and these are strictly things you request. Videos from the class sessions, sure, I will record and post the entire class sessions. But if you want to see solutions to recommended problems or topics in the course by video, then you request those, I fill those in. I don't necessarily fill things in here that you haven't requested because I think it's kind of an assignment on your part to request solutions to things that you're working on or have questions about. Uh, technology, talking about Zoom, talking about applications that you can make quick PDFs of your questions with. And later we might publish videos or suggestions about using your calculator, Desmos, or Excel. Last week he gave you one example about how to use Excel to do a problem. 
Okay, that's a quick tour of our week two page. Notice you have these recommended problems right here for each section. We're gonna cover sections two, one through two, four this week. That's what you're responsible to cover. And so let's look at some problems from two, one and two, two. Let me go back to my paper. These are the questions I was curious about in sections two, one and two, two. Uh, let me get this settled on a different screen, excuse me. Okay, good. These are the questions I'm interested in. Uh, you're welcome to attend the session and submit any questions you'd like to see done in the chat window or just speak up and vocalize them. So notice I just made that correction. I misspoke that the homework number one, the written homework was due on Monday. No, it's due Tuesday, January 19th. So due tomorrow by 11.59 p.m. And then I'll post a next homework, a next written homework about that time. Okay, let us open up the book. Let me show you some examples. And I'll just do as many of these as look interesting to me. That we can fit in to the session. Sorry, I'm sneaking a little bit of lunch there. And you can bring any questions you want to ask. I'm going to open up our book online so I can actually share the text of the homework problems with you. So the link to our online book is posted in our syllabus. I'm just navigating to it in my screen. Like I said, when you come to the class, you can share video, not share video. I'm not much for sharing video because I want to concentrate on my paper and not concentrate on looking at the camera. So I'm just going to block that video and start working on these problems. Let's look at problem number two in section two one, just to warm up. So I'm gonna share that screen with you to show you what it looks like. Our statistics book from the link from our syllabus, I can view it online in that lower left-hand corner. I navigate to chapter two, section one, but I'm gonna go straight to the practice problems and the homework problems. Um, I accidentally clicked an update button and that was not my intention. Okay. Let's look at this problem right here. And I will raise this up a bit. So height in feet of 25 trees is shown below lowest to highest. They want us to create a stem and leaf plot for this data. Remember a stem and leaf plot is a quick way to organize a small amount of data. And we plot things by the leaves, which is the last significant digit in the data, and the stem, which is all the digits that precede it. So here are 25 trees ranging from 25 to 54 in height, feet. And I'm just going to write on my paper a quick stem and leaf plot for this. Uh, as I said, I might tend to write in pencil when I'm doing these, but I'm just going to scratch out a quick answer here. So I've got data from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. All this data is two digits, like 25, 27, 
33, 34, 34, 34 occurred three times, 35, 37 occurred twice, 37 occurred twice, 38, 39 occurred three times. So these are the leaves, this is the stem. I'm gonna go back to my paper while I'm reading this. It's kind of awkward to read this book and write to the paper. So let me stop sharing the screen because I'm looking at my book. But I'll go back to my paper writing. And I have data 40, 41, 45, 46, 47, and 49. And I have data 50, two 50s, two 53s, and two 54s. That's all I have to do for this. This is a stem and leaf plot. And all this data is grouped together pretty well. They said identify any outliers. And what if I had a tree of like 82 feet? I know it had a point all alone outside here by itself. I might be able to call that an outlier. We'll be more specific about what we call an outlier later. But this is a stem and leaf plot for two one number two. This is a quick example. Let's move to another example. Uh, we're asked to do in number 10. Six high schools participate in countywide science competition percentage breakdowns, construct a bar graph. Okay, let's do a bar graph. Uh, problems five through seven asked for a line graph. Why don't I do a quick line graph say problem number six. Let's add number six to this. What I'd like to do is I'm trying to decide if I can show the book and show my paper at the same time. That's not so easy, is it? So let's look at this example. I think I have to invent a way to do that. 2.1 number six. And we get this data right here. Years since last purchase and frequency. So rewriting whole tables is going to be a little bit troublesome, isn't it? So that's why I'm gonna rely on pulling up the book, but let's just experiment here for a while. Two, eight, 13, 22, 16, nine. And what does this describe? How many years has it been since they purchased a mattress? So I'll just abbreviate very quickly. When was the last mattress you purchased? They surveyed several people and they came up with these responses. How many people did they survey, by the way? Two and eight is 10, 13 is 23, 45, 16, 55, 61, 70. It looks like they surveyed 70 people. The question doesn't mention that, but I can tell that from the frequency. Now, years since last purchased, this is, as we've described in the previous chapter one, categorical data. It's not time continuing, it's not time linked, but I want to put people into five boxes. 
six boxes here, according to the 70 people I surveyed. Have you purchased a mattress within zero years? In other words, within the last year. Has it been one year, at least since you purchased mattress, two years, three years, four years, five years? So I'm putting people into categorical boxes. I want to plan my frequency chart. And they asked for a line graph. So I'm just going to construct a line graph with these frequencies here. I'm going to plan to do frequencies from 2 to 22. So we got to give you some tips on doing things like this, you know, choosing and judging scale. If I have to go up to 22, should I count by tens? Should I count by twos? Should I count by ones? Counting by ones, and let's make each box worth one. That would be kind of awkward because I'd have to come up with 22 boxes. Excuse me, I have to advance my paper. But I'm going to plan a useful little graph right here where I mark the categories 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 on the horizontal axis. And then I'm going to mark frequency between 0 and 22 on the vertical axis. So what's a reasonable scale here? Why don't I count by fives? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. I don't have anything as high as 25 or 30. So let me just mark 0, 5, 10, 15, and 20, 25. So this axis represents frequency. This axis represents years. And the graph is years since last mattress purchase. So try to label your axes. Try to give your graph a title so people understand what it represents. Okay, now they asked for a line graph here. They want a line graph. And line graph is when you mark these points, horizontal axis and vertical axis, and then connect them with lines. Now, I'm not going to mark 2 and 8 and 13 exactly because I've chosen a raw scale here, right? But I can mark them responsibly. And so I should point this out that when you're creating graphs, you should absolutely use graph paper so you can mark your horizontal and vertical axes consistently and neatly and quickly instead of you struggling to mark 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way up to 22. Let's mark these points responsibly. Let's say 2 is about right there. Years since last purchase. Zero years since last purchase. Two people said that. How about one year since last purchase? Eight people said that. And I can responsibly mark that between 5 and 10, almost you know, past halfway, nearing 10. 13 people in two years since last purchase. I can responsibly mark that as two ticks below 15. 22, three years since last purchase. I'll mark that as two ticks above 20, so to speak. That dot, is it exactly at 22? Well, it's responsibly at 22. 16 should just be one fifth of the way from 15 to 20. So that's rather closer to that line. And nine should be nearly 10, one fifth of the way away from 10. And a line graph just connects these dots with straight lines. Maybe we could talk about later why I'd want to choose a line graph as opposed to a bar graph or a histogram. But this does convey some information to me that 
for many people, they haven't purchased a mattress for three years. You know, a group of people have purchased a mattress less than three years from now. But a lot of people have purchased a mattress three years from now, maybe four or five. I don't know, you know, what your personal experience is. So whether you purchase a mattress has to do with a lot of things. Uh, do you have children in the house? Are the children growing out of a previous mattress? Do you personally have a mattress that you've had for a long time? You know, maybe you haven't purchased a mattress for 10 or 20 years. But on the other hand, if you have young people in the house growing, maybe you've purchased a mattress more frequently for them. So I can't read too much into this data, but this graph summarizes this data well. This graph, this line graph summarizes this data well. Now, this is a categorical data right here. Even though the categories were made of numbers, so even the categories were made of numbers, which I called years, I was putting people into six different boxes. We have another form of a line graph coming up called a frequency polygon, and maybe we'll do demos of that later. Okay, got a demo of that on the board. Let's look at 2110. And, you know, maybe my solution to showing you the book as we go along, I may have to depend on you reading the problem out of the book. So I won't recopy every table, or I'd have a horrible amount of copying to do. I just want to show you examples relatively quickly. So right now this is, you know, okay, I should say it's from section 2.1 again. So here we have, and I'll read this problem to you and then we'll construct a table. You can simultaneously refer to your book so you see the numbers that I'm reading. It says David County has six high schools. Each school sent students to participate in a science competition. And the table below shows you percentage breakdown of competitors from each school and the percentage of the entire student population in that county. So six schools from one county and some of the schools represent more of the county population than others do. Some of the schools sent more competitors than others did. So we want a bar graph that shows the population percentage of competitors from each high school. The population percentage of competitors. So in this problem, that is the first column. Science competition population. So I'm gonna construct now a bar graph. Uh, I'm gonna label these pages as I go along so that I can post this later. I want to keep my eye on that so I admit anybody who comes in. So this again is categorical data. It's not a measuring data, categorical data in this case means I'm talking about six high schools. One high school is not different than another high school. They're not ordered, they're not measured. So I just want to show you a raw comparison between the six high schools. And I'm gonna do that in a bar graph and I'm gonna represent the competition. population as a percentage 
Remember, I'm allowed to think about a frequency as a percentage. A frequency of 0 0.10 is, means 10%. And here I'm going to represent the six schools. Now, I don't want to write out their entire names. So I'm going to abbreviate the six schools and call this Alabaster, Concordia, Genoa, GE. I'm just going to use the first two letters in their names. Moxville Tynanson and West End. West End is composed of two words. Maybe I'll use a W E for West End. If I was doing this in a more formal presentation, I think I might write out their entire names, but I might not write them out horizontally. I might write them vertically so that I could fit their entire names in. But these are the schools in David County. I knew there was a reason why I like this problem. Strictly a coincidence. And I don't have any scale on the x-axis. Do you see that? I'm not counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm just marking these schools. And I made each mark two units wide just so I could neatly fill in their names. Now, how about frequency? I didn't leave myself a lot of room to write over here on the left-hand side, but the frequency goes up to 28.9. You know, it looks like 10%, 20%, 30% would cover things nicely but I did write a little bit sloppily, a little bit too crowded here. I should have planned that better before I started writing. That's why I should write in pencil. Okay, what does Alabaster County represent? 28.9%. I do not know how to mark 28.9 in between 20 and 30, but it's gotta be pretty close to 30, right? And nearly 29. So let's make a bar that I can credibly say could be 28.9% high. Concordia 7.6, that would be almost halfway between 5% and 10%. And Genoa 12.1 would be between 10 and 15%, still closer to 10%. I can call that 12.1. And Moxville, 18.5, would be creeping up to 19, getting closer to 20. I am not measuring these exactly. I'm not claiming that, but I am measuring them credibly. If, if I put 18.5 on this midline between 10 and 20, that's not credible. So you do have to make your scale count when you're doing these drawings. 24.2 is very nearly 25. So I'll put Tynanson at that height. And Weston was about 8.7. And that was down here. Uh, nearly nine, that's true, nearly nine. I should make that a little bit higher. Now, if I wanna communicate even more exactly what these are, sometimes you see people write in the percentages in each box. Or if the boxes are small, they write, write my percentages on top of each box. So no one would fault you if you wrote 28.9% here. Since there's not many things to write here, this is not hard to add on to your bar chart. But this just compares size of the teams, you know, the competition population, what part of the competitors came from each of these six high schools. So what is important about a bar chart? What's important about a bar graph bar chart is that this is 
categorical data. It's not continuous data, numerical data necessarily. And I am not writing a scale like counting boxes from left to right. I'm just organizing people as they were presented to me. Remember a special bar graph, a bar graph is a Pareto chart where you put people in descending order. Then I would have rearranged these. Notice in bar graphs, you do not connect the bars because you're not representing continuous data. You're just representing categories of data. Okay, so that's an important description. Uh, should you shade these in or not shade these in? Uh, your call when people print a book with ink or write an Excel spreadsheet, yeah, they shade these in. But frankly, you're gonna just use a lot of ink and time if you wanna darken these. So if your bars are clearly drawn like this, I don't think you should shade them in. You know, you could cross hatch them if you want to, but I don't even say I recommend that. Just draw your bars clearly at credible heights and use graph paper. I will start to mark you in the second assignment and so forth. You need to use graph paper. For that reason, there's graph paper available on our website, I believe. And I'll double check that or show you where to get it later. Okay, we are looking at section 2.1 and we've hit number 10. Now let's go for something fancier. Let's look at 75. This is an actual homework problem. And you know, as I, what I'm doing here is just cruising through the problems, picking out ones that I thought were interesting. Now 75 is an entirely larger problem. And so even though they're not asking me to construct a sophisticated table, they gave me a lot of data to examine. So I'll read this to you and then I might show it to you under the camera. It says the following table contains the 2010 obesity rates in the US states and the District of Columbia, Washington, DC. There are 50 states and the District of Columbia is 51st category. These are categories, categories by state. So what they present in this table are 51 categories. Then they are presented the percentage of people who fit the obesity definition uh, what rate of people in that state or District of Columbia are medically labeled as obese. Uh, that's a medical definition. I am not completely familiar with that definition, but I know that uh, probably I could afford to use, uh, lose a little bit of weight. So you might look up the definition of obesity and uh, say, hmm, Maybe you're a little bit more extra weight than you expect you have. Uh, in, in my case, that is the case. Now, it says, let's make a bar graph. And the problem has three parts, A, B, and C. Part A, use a random number generator, to pick eight states, construct a bar graph of the BC rates in these eight states. Construct a bar graph for all states that begin with the letter A. Construct a bar graph for all states that begin with the letter M. Let's at least do two of these. I see five, no, four states that begin with the letter A. I see how many states that begin with the letter M? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven states that begin with the letter M. And then if I used a random number to pick eight states, well, which ones would I pick? Okay, so now it's time for me to show you this chart and show you my calculator. Let's see if I can fit this under the camera without causing a disruption. Let's see if I can, I'm gonna wiggle the camera for a second, so hang on. I'm just trying to get some wires out of my way. Okay, good. So here are, and I'm gonna have to get a glass out of the way. Here are the 50 states. And part of why I wanted to show you this problem was to show you on your calculator, which they pointed out to you in chapter one, how to choose eight of these randomly. They don't mean close your eyes and point at the table. 
They mean let's pick numbers from one to 51 randomly. And I don't trust myself to do that. And they don't trust any of us to do that. So you have a command on your computer that can pick random numbers. Then let me show you where it is on your, on your calculator. So here's a calculator. I am going to get some uh, calculator that is like an application on my screen. I have to do that because right now I understand that it's not easy to view this calculator right here. But under the math button, fourth row, first button, under math, you have categories and one of them called the probability category will generate random numbers for you. A lot of commands here, we don't need all of them, but I want to generate a random integer. Now I'm going to show you two ways to do that. Random integer and the calculator says from where to where. I want to say from one to 51 and I want eight numbers. Now the calculator says paste. In other words, it's building the command for you. So when I hit paste, it writes the command out for me. From one to 81, eight numbers randomly chosen. Now, when I do that, I see that I have eight numbers here and there are no repeats. But there could be, if I ran this command again, maybe numbers that repeat themselves. And I don't want to pick the same state twice necessarily. Here's no repeats in that list. I see a repeat in this list. 50 was chosen twice. State number 50 was chosen twice. So I want to show you how to avoid that without continuously repressing the button. And that is under the math command. You could go to probability, random integer with no repeats. That command number eight, from one to 51, select eight numbers randomly without repeating. That looks like this. And this will guarantee you no repeats. OK, what do I got? I got 21, 46, 26. And I'm going to move this calculator off screen so I can just mark these states. Now, notice I have 51 records here and three columns. State, percentage, state, percentage, state, percentage. 51 divided by 3, this comes out evenly. These must be 17 in each one. So I'm going to count 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So I'm going to take Maryland, 46. This will be 51, 34, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46. 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. 51 because we included Washington, D.C. <coughs> 26 would be 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Notice I also picked 21 here, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. So I'm using these random numbers here to read off states. 18 would be the top of this column, Kentucky. Uh, was in Kentucky recently. 15, six, I'm sorry, 17, 16, 15, Indiana. I was born in Indiana. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not trying to be too pushy or personal. I'm just going through my list of states in my head. 51, 50, 49, 48. Washington, the state of Washington. It's been a long time since I was in that state, I think. No, oh, sorry, I didn't want to repeat that. Uh, 15, 48, 27 would be one more than 26, Montana. Because in my mind, I'm kind of ticking off if I ever been in that state. 51, 50. 49, 48, 47, 46 was Vermont, 45, 44, 43, 42. Okay, I have picked out on this table, although only for my benefit, you don't see the dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight states. 
And now I'm going to create a bar graph that shows you the percentage in these eight states of obesity rates. So I'm going to move that and the book out of the way. And I'm going to make a bar graph, but this time I think I will go to pencil just to see how it works on the screen. I scan the eight states that I picked out, and I've got a 30 percenter in there, two 30 percenters, close to 30 percent, 23. What's a low going on? 23 percent, 25 percent. Everything's between, you know, 20 and 30 percent. I could just mark that on the bar graph just between 20 and 30 percent vertically. I don't really want to do that. I'd like to start from zero when I can. So I might go 10, 20, 30 like I did before. Uh, since I go past 30 in Kentucky, I go slightly past 30 in Missouri, the states I chose, then I will go to 40 on this. So I'm going to make this chart a little more compact. How about 10, 20, 30, 40 percent? And that means my bars will still be estimates, right? My bars will be estimates. And I'll just do the best job I can of estimating a 17 or a 14.2. Now let's do eight states. And I don't want to make them too wide here. So I'm going to make these bars just one box wide, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That goes farther than I expected anyway. Let me put the states that I chose in order. IN will stand for Indiana. I'll use the zip code abbreviations of the states. Kentucky is KY. Uh, Maryland, er, I think it's MD. You have to correct this if I'm wrong. Missouri is definitely MO. Montana is, I believe, MT. And what do we got here? South Dakota is definitely SD. Vermont is definitely VT. Never been to, I think I drove through Vermont once. Washington, WA. Do I have eight states here? Yes, I do. Now let's mark their percentages. Indiana was 29.6, so nearly at 30. Very nearly at 30. And then Kentucky was 31.3, slightly over 30. Maryland was 27.1. So that's a little bit in between, but closer to 30. Make sure that, see, I'm judging this bar right here to be between 20 and 30, and that's about 7.1. Uh, I think that's fair. It might be a little bit higher than I expected. 30.5 is for the next state. 30.5 is Missouri. That's just barely over 30, not even noticeably over 30, possibly. 23, next state, Montana. Certainly closer to 20 than 30. And then we're talking about next state. South Dakota, 27.3. And uh, what are we looking at? Vermont, 23.2. I am really just estimating these, but I'm estimating them credibly. 25.5, be a little bit over halfway between 20 and 30. I'm making little bars here now. Remember, this is categorical data. I have no scale on the horizontal axis. I just have the names of the categories, which in this case were eight different states. What does this information tell me? These numbers are all kind of similar. There's the highest and the lowest among these bars to be sure. Maybe I could write the numbers on top of each bar like I did previously. I think I'll do that, but I will tilt them sideways and then I'll bring them back to you so that I could write them 29.6%. This is 
admittedly a little bit of work, 31.3%, 27.1%. Cause these bars are so close to each other. It's a little bit hard for me to read them against the scale. They're not very different, I'm saying. Okay, here's a state with less Montana. Maybe more active people in that state. How do you know? South Dakota, 27.3%. Vermont is one of the lower ones at 23.2%. Not as low as Montana, but very close. Washington, 25.5%. This labeling of numbers across the top is not required, but it's a little bit helpful. So I don't gather serious patterns out of this data here, other than I could say, oh my goodness, it's pretty clear across those eight states that one in five people uh, meet the definition of obese, the medical definition. So I could say clearly in the United States, is that the case that at the very least one in five people meet that definition? That's probably a pretty safe statement. In the United States, it might be closer to one in four, I think. Okay, but again, this is a bar graph and it's very noticeable that the bars are not connected because this is not continuous data, no scale on this axis. I should label the axis as states and obesity rates. And I should give a title to my graph. Obesity rates in eight U.S. States. And a title should be relatively descriptive. I'm only representing eight, steer, eight states here. So I just picked eight states randomly. Okay, you can do the ones that begin with A and the ones that begin with M yourself. So I'm just practicing writing a neat graph. I guess what I'm illustrating is showing that the bars don't touch. In a bar graph, we're about to do a histogram and there the bars touch. But the bars don't touch in a bar graph. I'm marking scale though very neatly and very reasonably. I'm not just throwing different heights down at random. I'm labeling my axes, labeling the entire graph. And then I'm even adding a label at the top of this. I guess in the previous graph, I could have added a title. Always add a title to your graphs. I think that's pretty much a requirement here. Was this a science fair or the science Olympiad or what was this? Science competition. Participants. By high school. Be very specific. In David County. Okay, so yeah, you might uh, try to make your titles brief. The more specific you are, the less brief you are, but you know, you can make the titles representative of what you're doing. Okay, let's move on and try something else. And to too many examples in there. Let's look at some histogram example and try to illustrate for you what the difference is between a histogram and a bar chart. So practice problems 12, 18, 22, and then 78, 79, 80. I wanna make sure I get a good full problem in here. So let's look at 78, 79, 80 in section 2.2. Two. You know, what I'm looking at 
because I'm confusing myself. And I just did 75. Oh, okay, okay, good, I understand that. This is problem 75. They repeat that data again in 81. And I don't wanna repeat that problem. So let's look, maybe it's 78, 79 or 80. thinking which one do I prefer to do here? Problem 78 or problem 22 is also a good problem. And I'm picking these problems out of the ones I listed on the website. Police and homicides. And um, that was in Detroit, Michigan. That is kind of an interesting example. And those were years, time series, variable. Okay, so those are interesting problems. Eighteen or seventy-eight. I'm looking at right here. Let's look at 18 first, and then I'll see if I can squeeze in another one. 18, 12. Yeah, let's do 18 in a particular way. So, This is example, write this off to the side. Number 18, section 2.2, .2, practice problems. And it gives you a table of pulse rates for women and I will recreate the table because I want to comment on the table. And then it talks about frequency. So they must have made a survey. They're saying this, making a survey specifically of women, not just men and women. And they list the pulse rates of 60 to 69. 70 to 79, 80 to 89, 90 to 99, 100 to 109, 110 to 119, uh, 120 to 129, uh, these are not unusual pulse rates. I think in the healthy range, you're talking about 70s and 80s, maybe 90s. Uh, a elite athlete might have a pulse rate. I've certainly seen recordings of that even in the 40s, a resting pulse rate. They don't tell me whether it's resting or after exercise, but let's assume this is resting. Frequency 12, 14. 11, one, one, zero, and one. Even from the data here, I see most people are below 100, certainly. There's a person here sampled between 120 and 129. You could sample your own pulse rate and see where you come in. Now, I'm gonna draw two graphs here to illustrate two techniques. A histogram, which kind of looks like a bar graph, but it's different. And a frequency polygon, which kind of looks like a line graph that we did earlier. This was a line graph. A frequency polygon looks like this, but has an important difference. 
The histogram looks like this bar chart, but has important differences. So frequency polygon. I do not want to cram these into this paper. I do not want to make things too tight, but I'm deciding if I can put them into this little space right here. And, you know, I think I could. Let's give it a shot. And if I have to go to another piece of paper, I will. I will use a pencil or a pen. I think I'll still use a pencil to make sure that I can erase any mistakes. This chart was written in pencil. It seems readable on the camera. This chart was written in pen, which is very readable. Okay, what is the difference between a histogram and a bar chart? Bar chart, bar graph, you could see it either way. A histogram, the horizontal axis is representing continuous groups. So 60 to 69 is a lower pulse rate than 70 to 79 is a lower pulse rate than 80 to 89, et cetera. And these are in order. I do not say Indiana is a lower state than Kentucky and Maryland is a higher state than Kentucky. I would get in a lot of trouble if I said something like that. So this data is categorical, unordered, but this data is definitely ordered. These data categories here are called classes. In other words, if I measure your pulse, you're gonna find that your pulse is 82. And that puts you in this third class. You could say that your pulse is between 80 and 89, but that's not specific enough if you're at the doctor's office having a medical visit, right? They're going to measure your pulse to the nearest beat per minute, approximately. Notice they will never record your pulse as 82.7, even if the approximation would say 82.7. So generally, I'm not a nurse, but I have nurses in the family, you know, standard technique was they hold your wrist and feel your pulse for 15 seconds. And I got to see if I can even do that. Let me measure my pulse right here just to see what's happening. Come 15 seconds. Okay, sorry, I was silent there for 15 seconds and I counted 19 beats of my heart from my wrist. So in 15 seconds, I'm assuming that I would do four times that in one minute, four times 19 is 76. So that would put me in this category. And commonly they would hold your pulse for 15 seconds and then multiply by four. I guess they can have machines do it more accurately. So these are classes of data. And in a histogram, these classes of data are next to each other. 70 to 79 is right next to 60 to 69. So I'm gonna mark this in my histogram. Here's one way I could mark it. And notice I got frequencies running from uh, zero to 15. So why don't I count 5, 10, 15, 20. That would be fair. Something a little more than I need. 5, 10, 15, 20. So these are frequencies, not relative frequencies. These are raw frequencies. 20, 15, 10, 5, 0. And now I'm going to measure these classes from 60. Next class starts at 70, next class starts at 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. So these bars, this time, a histogram, the bars touch because they represent continuous data. So from 60 to 69, I mark 12 people and I fill up that whole space. Now you could say, oh, there's a gap between 69 and 70, but not in pulse measurements. 
there's no one with a pulse measurement of 69.5. Okay, 14 is between 10 and 15, nearly 15, and then 11 is slightly over 10. And then we have one, one, and zero. Just having fun with our local family members. Don't mind if you hear any rattling of macaroni boxes in the background. I'm in the basement right now. Nobody measured a pulse between uh, 110 and 119. Oh, I suppose I should go up to 110 to 130. And that would be called one. So here's my histogram. It's like a bar graph but it is bars touching each other to show you that I have no gaps in my measurements. How many women were in the survey? Maybe I should add these together. We got my 30s, got 37. Looks like I surveyed or took the pulse of 40 women. I should say here, this category is the frequency. Sometimes people write frequency sideways to save them space. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but that means I gotta rotate my paper in front of you. And here I am measuring the pulse rate. Okay, again, don't color these in. That just is more time than you need, as long as your bars are very clear. Here's your title. So this is a histogram, because this time I'm talking about numerical data in the pulse rates, continuous numerical data, a scale, a measurement. Now let's repeat it for a frequency polygon. And it depends on what your impression of a frequency polygon is here. You know, you might not be impressed with this. You might think frequency polygon, why would I want to use that? That doesn't look that pretty. It doesn't look that representative. Frequency polygon is like a line graph. It's often best represented when you're talking about time. For example, let's use the same horizontal scale, 60, 70, 80. I'll just fill this in without speaking it. Makes me write faster, I'm not sure. But what I do in a frequency polygon is I take each of these classes and I put the frequency point as a dot at the midpoint. So between 60 and 70, it's 65, I mark 12. That dot is at 65 and 12. I should put my vertical scale in here, right? Always mark and label your scale, always use graph paper. And you'll either find the graph paper on my webpage that you could print, or you could buy some graph paper at Staples, you know, three, five dollars for a sheet for a pad of graph paper that's going to last you the semester. That's a very worthwhile investment because it'll make your drawings better. I'm going to mark it 7514. I'm going to mark it 8511. I'm going to mark it's hard to tell the difference between 12 and 11 right here, right? But I'm doing the best I can. I'm going to mark at 95.01. I'm going to mark at 105.01. I'm going to mark at 110 to 119. I'm going to mark at 115 as zero. And I'm going to mark at 125.01. Now, so far, this looks like a line graph.
And what's it telling me? There's not many people with a pulse rate above 100. That's true, a resting pulse rate is usually not above 100. But I am not saying that 12 people reported a pulse rate of 65. I'm just using 65 as the middle of this class to make a single dot. And you could see that if I had thousands of dots, I wouldn't want to draw thousands of bars. So a frequency polygon might be a good idea if I'm talking about many dots on a horizontal scale. But a frequency polygon covers one more thing. It encodes one more thing. I want to tell people, notice I didn't have anybody between 50 and 60. I want to tell people that I recorded no records between 50 and 60. So at 55, I actually put a zero dot and make that the first dot of the graph. And I want to tell people that I recorded no one above 130. So I put a dot, a zero dot at 135, which would be the next group. And I put a line down to 135. That is so short right there, it's hard to see it. I could drag my camera in very close, but then I think I'd kind of mess up my camera. Maybe I'll do that in a second. So this is again still pulse rates for 40 women. This is the pulse rate on the horizontal axis. This is the frequency that I'll write sideways on the vertical axis. Let me bring my camera in really close, although this is gonna be kind of risky because probably can't fix the arm again. <laughs> I'm just dealing with a camera on some kind of metal arm right here. So I don't have a zoom feature, but I just wanna show you that way down here at the bottom, trying to tip my camera correctly. I do have data above 100, just very little. And you saw that in the table, very little data above 100. Okay, this is a frequency polygon. And one of the differences of frequency polygon is I have a zero starting point and a zero ending point to make sure I communicate to people when my records started and stopped, no records between 50 and 60, no records, no data between 130 and 140. But the histogram is perfectly legitimate for this purpose since I don't have too many categories here. The histogram is very nice. Do you know a histogram, these things called classes, you generally have five, 10, 15 classes. You don't do a histogram with two classes. That would be kind of boring. You don't do a histogram with a thousand classes. That would be confusing. So histogram, traditionally, you're gonna say between five and 15 classes. And the book gives you some reasons or some methods for choosing how many classes you should use. I don't know if I'll have a chance to illustrate that here yet. If you're doing some problems in the book where you're trying to choose how many classes you're using, send me a request and I'll point out how they calculate how many classes they use. I'll give you a quick rule of thumb in a second. But a frequency polygon, if I had lots and lots of classes so that the bars would be so tiny that they would be hard to see, they're so thin, and they're almost like a single dot. So frequency polygon is frequently used when you have a lot of classes, excuse me, when you have a lot of classes on the horizontal axis. Here I only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine classes counting the beginning and end. I only had seven classes of data. 
Okay, what else do I want to say about that? There was something I was, oh, here's a simple rule of thumb for how many classes. Do you see I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven classes presented to me? And notice I had how many records? 37, I had 40 records. So sometimes people do this. They look at the total number of records or data points, they have 40, and they take a square root of that. And square root of 40 is on my calculator. Excuse me. Can't see my calculator clearly without my glasses. Square root of 40, about 6.3. So people usually take that number and round up. Sometimes they do that to seven. And maybe that's why this person used seven classes. Now that's not a hard and fast rule. It's not a must rule. It's just a suggestion to help you organize. If I had 100 records, I could use maybe 10 classes. I could use less. There are fancier rules for choosing classes that he presents, that she presents, excuse me, in the book. And you can read them there or we can illustrate. Okay, we're near at the end of our hour. So first of all, let me see if I can fix my camera. So excuse me while I wiggle you around here. And I've just done some basic graph examples. I haven't done nearly as many I wanted to, but you can request any of these as you like. Now, 18, I did 18A right here, pulse rate. They also had speed in a 30 mile per hour zone. That's interesting. And they had tar and non-filtered cigarettes, but I did 18A. You could look at 78, 79, and 80 as well to show you interesting histogram examples or frequency polygons. I do wanna say this about histograms, that I have some freedom in the labels I choose for classes. But I do want to do this, that for example, I need to make an agreement with you as to where I put the person whose pulse is 80. The person with a pulse of 80, do they belong in this box or in that box? So if there's any potential for overlap, what we do is say this is from 60 all the way up to 70. If you have a pulse of 70, you go in the second box. This is 80 all the way up to 90. If you have a pulse of 90, you go in this short box, the fourth box. So you cannot have a person whose pulse is 80 show up twice. You can't count them twice. You can only count them once. So we'll say if you have to make a choice, you always make them show up at the left-hand endpoint at most. Now some people even choose these box labels, these class labels, so that there's no possibility of overlap. And in a way they did that here when they presented this table. We have no one with a pulse rate of 69.5. There's a clear difference between 69 and 70. But you can further refine these labels so that you never have someone show up on an end point of a class. In the book, she describes how to do that. And if you'd like to see how to do that on a more formal problem, we can do that together. But mostly this is about constructing, representing, making an honest picture of the data. What I've shown you in all the problems I've done here on these two pages today, one, two, three, four, five, six different graphs. I've shown you an honest, and clear representation, graphical representation of data, clearly labeled, carefully measured, clearly described. When you represent 
the information in a table in a graph, you're doing someone a great service and you want this to be extraordinarily clear. It's not hard to read this table. It's only got seven categories, but this picture drives the point home. Not many people had a resting pulse rate above 90. Now that's a survey of a certain group of people and a small number. So I don't wanna say measure your pulse. If your pulse is 96, you're gonna panic. Don't do that. I'm just saying in this sample, it is very clear that not many people had a pulse rate above 90. Go to my table and say, oh yeah, that's true. Only three people had a pulse rate above 90. So your goal when you make a graph, histogram, bar chart, frequency polygon, line graph, stem and leaf plot, your goal is to represent the data at a snapshot. Just someone could look at it instantly and see what's happening basically. Okay, I am going to stop this recording and I'm gonna post it to our website so people can consume it later. If you want to see some other problems on this list, you send me a request and I'll post these as problems to the list. I know you guys are working hard at this. In a sense, you're working independently. I want to help you out by posting solutions to other problems but I wanna be really clear about this. I won't just randomly pick problems and throw them at you. You are doing the problems. You tell me what you need, okay? I won't post things often that you do not request. Okay, work on that first homework. I'll send out an email reminder later today and uh, stop by on Wednesday. We'll do some more problems on Wednesday in sections two, three, and two, four. Thank you very much.